This video is brought to you by Stony Labs. Use code Wheeler for 10% off at checkout. In our last video, we tackled pain head on chemically by synthesizing benzocaine, an ester made from para amino benzoic acid and ethanol. It numbs the nerves right when it's applied, offering us a powerful glimpse into how chemists outsmart pain. But today we're leveling up. Our mission transformed benzocaine into its more powerful and famous cousin, procaine, better known by its trade name, novocaine. At first glance, these two molecules seem like close relatives, both esters of paraaminobenzoic acid. But Novocaine swaps out benzocaine's simple ethanol group for a specialized diethylaminoethanol, drastically boosting its solubility and anesthetic strength. This small chemical tweak turns Novocaine into a superstar anesthetic, widely used for dental work and surgery. Novocaine didn't just change medicine, it infiltrated pop culture, from dentist jokes and gritty crime thrillers to punk rock anthems like Green Day's Cry, Give Me Novocaine. This drug has made an indelible mark, yet how many people realize it begins with straightforward organic chemistry? Today we are changing that, let's dive into the chemistry and step into the lab to upgrade our humble benzocaine into its well-known counterpart, Novocaine. First we need diethylaminoethanol to replace the ethanol in the benzocaine. To synthesize this, I begin by adding 38 grams of diethylamine into a 250ml round bottom flask. I then fitted the flask with a reflux condenser and a dropping funnel. I used a clay as an adapter so I can have multiple attachment points. Attached to the reflux condenser, I have a drying tube to protect the reaction from atmospheric moisture. Since diethylamine is both volatile and strongly basic, I make sure to do all the handling in a well-ventilated fume hood. I also wear gloves and goggles. The vapors are irritating and direct contact can cause chemical burns. I gently heat the diethylamine to boiling on a steam bath to keep the temperature controlled and avoid overheating or decomposition. With the diethylamine boiling steady, I pour into the dropping funnel 32 grams of ethylene chlorohydrin, commonly referred to as 2-chloroethanol. I should preface that this is a nasty and toxic chemical, and must be treated with care. It can cause major eye irritation. Also, 2-chloroethanol is a central nervous system depressant, which means it can cause you to stop breathing. 2-chloroethanol is then slowly added dropwise through the funnel over the course of about an hour. 2-chloroethanol can also be absorbed through the skin, so I'm being extra cautious with spills and to wear thick gloves. The slow addition controls the rate of reaction and helps prevent a runaway exothermic reaction. What's happening here is a simple nucleophilic substitution. The nitrogen in the diethylamine attacks the carbon bonded to the chlorine, displacing the chlorine ion and forming a new bond with the ethylene group. Once all the 2-chloroethanol is added, I keep the reaction refluxing for about another 8 hours. This extended heating period ensures the reaction goes to completion and allows any intermediate products to fully convert to the diethylaminoethyl alcohol. Throughout this time, I monitor the temperature and let the reaction run normally. After the reflux is complete, I allow the mixture to cool to room temperature. I then prepare a solution of 23 grams of sodium hydroxide in 35 milliliters of water. I then add the solution fairly quickly to the reaction flask. The sodium hydroxide neutralizes hydrochloride salts and helps break up any emulsions if they've formed. As expected, two layers form immediately, an organic layer and an aqueous layer, with solid sodium chloride precipitating between them. To dissolve the sodium chloride and help with extractions, I add an additional 40 milliliters of water. Then I pour in about 50 milliliters of benzene and begin a liquid-liquid extraction. Benzene selectively pulls the organic diethylaminoethyl alcohol into its layer. I stir the mixture mechanically for about 5 minutes to ensure thorough mixing and good phase contact. I separate the benzene layer using a separatory funnel and repeat the extraction 3 more times, each with fresh 50 milliliter portions of benzene. This ensures that I've pulled out as much of the product that I can from the aqueous phase as possible. I combine all benzene extractions and dry the pooled solution over about 10 grams of potassium carbonate. Potassium carbonate absorbs any residual water and neutralizes trace acids. I stir the mixture mechanically until the solution becomes completely clear. This tells me that the drying is complete. Now it's time to distill. I set up a simple distillation apparatus with a packed column full of glass beads and a thermometer dipping into the liquid. I begin heating and collecting the distillate until the temperature of the liquid reaches 100 degrees Celsius and the vapor at the top of the column reaches about 85 degrees Celsius. This removes any of the benzene and other low boiling point impurities. What's left is the crude product, which I transfer to a 100 milliliter flask. Next, I switch to vacuum distillation to purify the product. Since diethylaminoethyl alcohol has a high boiling point and could decompose under normal atmospheric pressures, 
Under reduced pressure, it distills more gently, preserving the structure and improving yield. I set up a simple distillation setup with a Claisen adapter acting as a column. The temperature is then ramped up until distillation takes place. At first, a low boiling point material comes over, and then once the temperature began to rise, I switched out the flask and began collecting our product. This continued for some time until distillation stopped. At this point, I allowed the distillation apparatus to cool and shut off the vacuum pump. After all is said and done, I isolated about 24.6 grams of purified diethylaminoethyl alcohol, which was confirmed via NMR. Now let's talk about transesterification, a reaction in which the alcohol part of an ester is swapped out for another alcohol. My initial approach was straightforward. I tried a basic environment using sodium ethyl oxide, formed by reacting sodium metal with ethanol, then refluxing this mixture with benzocaine and diethylaminoethanol. Unfortunately, this reaction didn't produce novocaine effectively or at all. Instead, a sodium salt was formed of the paraaminobenzoic acid. So let's try something else to see if the base is just the problem. I next attempted to do the same reaction under strongly acidic conditions using sulfuric acid. Again, I faced issues. The equilibrium was heavily influenced by ethanol formation, limiting the product yield. According to Le Chatelier's principle, I tried to shift the equilibrium by removing ethanol as was formed via distillation, but this also didn't lead to significant novocaine production. I tried numerous transesterification methods in various conditions and got none of them to work. Okay, so now what? In chemistry, there are often multiple ways to reach a goal. Since transesterification proved challenging, I chose an alternative method using acid chloride chemistry. This requires starting over with p-nitrobenzoic acid instead of benzocaine. I would like to revisit transesterification again, so I want to ask, what do you think went wrong? As the acid chloride route uses an acid chloride for the reaction, we need to make one. So let's turn the p-nitrobenzoic acid into p-nitrobenzyl chloride. I start by dropping in a stir bar and weighing out exactly 6.08 grams of p-nitrobenzoic acid and adding it to a clean dry 100 milliliter round bottom flask. Next I measure out 15 milliliters of thionyl chloride using a graduating cylinder and add that to the flask. I then set up the reaction for reflux by attaching a condenser and then gently heating the mixture using a mantle. I allowed it to reflux for about 3 hours ensuring the reaction has gone to completion. Thionyl chloride reacts with carboxylic acids like p-nitrobenzoic acid, replacing the hydroxyl group with a chlorine and producing a acyl chloride, a much more reactive intermediate that I'll later use in the synthesis. Think of it as swapping out a weaker attachment, the OH group, for a stronger, more reactive chemical handle, the chlorine, that can better participate in the downstream reactions. Because thionyl chloride releases choking and corrosive gases like sulfur dioxide and hydrogen chloride, I always carry out these reactions in a well-ventilated fume hood and wear gloves and goggles and a lab coat. After reflux, I rearrange the setup and replace the condenser with a short path distillation head and remove as much excess thionyl chloride as I can under normal pressure. Once no more distillate came over, I pulled a strong vacuum to ensure thionyl chloride had been removed. After that, I allowed the residue to cool, and as it cools, crystals begin to form in the flask. I don't bother purifying it since I don't need it all that pure for the next steps. I simply scrape out the solid product, which yields just over 6.4 grams of p-nitrobenzyl chloride, ready for the next part of the reaction. Now it's time to put that chloride to use. Into a small flask, I measure out 0.84 grams of diethylaminoethanol and carefully mix in 1.6 gram of the fresh p-nitrobenzyl chloride that I just prepared. Almost immediately, I notice the reaction spontaneously heating up. This sudden warmth signals a chemical reaction between the acyl chloride and the alcohol amine combination, forming an ester linkage and releasing hydrogen chloride, which then quickly reacts to form a hydrochloride salt. After the initial burst of heat had stopped, I gently heat the mixture further. I noticed that the stir bar wasn't really stirring and the material wasn't mixing very well, so I added an extra solvent. In this case, I threw in some of my favorite chemical, toluene, which then allowed it to mix properly. I maintained it at about 110 degrees Celsius for two hours. This extra heating ensures that every molecule has fully reacted, leaving no leftover reactants. I used gentle and consistent heating to avoid overheating, which would decompose the product or cause unwanted side reactions. Once completed, I ended up with a solid product the hydrochloride salt of p-nitrobenzyl diethylaminoethanol. ethanol. To separate this from the solvent, I implored vacuum filtration, and this left us with a nice off-white powder material ready for the next step. Before that, let's check to see if we made what we think we made. I dissolved some of the material into a GCMS vial and ran it through the GCMS and detected nitrocaine, which is the common name of what we've made, which means we can start the next step. 
Now it's time to make our Novocaine. The only difference between our current material and our desired one is a nitro group instead of an amine. So let's take care of that. To continue, I added the nitrocaine to a 100 milliliter flask and dissolve the solid in approximately 10 milliliters of water. After that, I carefully add 2.1 grams of granulated tin. I attached the flask to a reflux condenser and slowly started to add 10 milliliters of hydrochloric acid to the top slowly. The reaction is exothermic, so it must be added slowly. The HCl reacts with the tin forming stannous chloride, which acts as our reducing agent. This reaction must be closely monitored, maintaining a temperature between 35 and 40 degrees Celsius to ensure that it proceeds smoothly without overheating. I place the flask into a water bath to maintain the heating and let it react. Constant stirring helps distribute the reactants and heat, preventing local overheating and ensuring thorough reactions. A thick oily intermediate formed, but as the reaction took place, it disappeared and we were left with a clear solution after a few hours of stirring and heating. Now we're left with a solution of tin and our product. To get rid of that tin, we need to turn it to a solid precipitate. I will use hydrogen sulfide gas. A gas generator was set up with hydrochloric acid dripping into iron sulfide and water. That creates sulfide gas, which is then bubbled through the solution. As the gas goes through the reaction material, an insoluble tin sulfide forms. It's important to note that hydrogen sulfide gas is highly toxic and will cause damage to the human body if breathed in. So it's very important that this step is done in a well-ventilated area that moves the hydrogen sulfide away from anybody. The solid precipitate is then filtered and refiltered through a syringe filter as the filter paper was letting in a bit of material. Once I've filtered the tin sulfide, we are left with a clear solution. I then carefully add saturated sodium carbonate solution to the clear filtrate until it becomes alkaline. This step is crucial because it causes the novocaine, the base form, to separate from solution. This was then filtered and rinsed with cold water to remove impurities. I took the paste-like material and spread it out over a watch glass to dry the product. And once dry, we were left with 2.3 grams of Novocaine. Typically, this base Novocaine is reacted with hydrochloric acid to form an HCl form, which makes it more shelf-stable protecting the amine group. I didn't end up doing this, and it reacted with the air darkening after a few weeks. To verify that I have indeed synthesized Novocaine, I prepared samples for instrumental analysis. Using dichloromethane as the solvent, I prepared a GCMS vial and then ran it. GCMS analysis confirms the successful synthesis of Novocaine, marking our experiment as a complete success. Chemistry often involves trial and error and innovation. Initially, transesterification seemed simple but didn't yield our desired product. Pivoting to acid chloride chemistry not only solved our issue, but also provided a clearer, more effective pathway to pure Novocaine. Have you faced similar challenges in your chemistry experiments? I'd love to hear about your stories in the comments section below. And as always, thanks for watching.